Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore thoughts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Today's episode is going to be uh, another really, really special one. I have with me Dr. Michael Ward. He is a professor of apologetics at Houston Baptist University, and we're going to be talking about his book, After Humanity. Let's see if I can get this up here. After Humanity, a guide to C.S. Lewis's The Abolition of Man. And uh, with that comes a copy of C.S. Lewis's Abolition of Man, which Lewis himself regarded as one of his three best works. So I'm really excited to talk about Lewis and Dr. Ward's work here. This book is fantastic. Um, I'm super stoked. Before we jump in, though, I want to thank everyone over at Patreon, all my Patreon uh, supporters called patrons. They uh, have been making the show happen. This is fantastic. If you've benefited from this podcast at all, please, please, please consider uh, becoming one of my patrons. I'm trying to do this full time. That would be fantastic. Um, the more patrons I get, the more places I can go, the more awesome guests I can get on, the better equipment I can get, uh, the more in-person episodes we can put out, and in-person conversations are always going to be better than not in-person conversations. So thank you guys so much for supporting the podcast. And again, if you guys have benefited, please consider becoming a patron. Another way to support the podcast is to uh, subscribe on YouTube and leave me a like and a comment. All that stuff helps the algorithms, helps get the stuff out there uh, more and more. And then above and beyond, you can go to Apple Podcasts and leave me a five-star review. Again, the, the algorithms, uh, they don't lie. Like they, well, maybe they lie. You can you can help me lie to the algorithms by going and leaving me a comment. Leave me a five-star review and a comment. That would be huge. Okay. Well, uh with all that out of the way, let's jump in to our conversation with Dr. Michael Ward. Michael, thanks so much for, for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Parker. I'm glad to be with you. Yeah. So as we were talking about uh, off air, um, we have a mutual acquaintance in Jerry Root. He's been on the podcast a couple of times and we've been talking about your work for a couple of years now. So it's it's really fantastic to get you on and uh, be able to pepper you with some of my own questions here. Yeah. Pepper away. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, first and foremost, how did you get into um, C.S. Lewis studies at all? Um, well, tracing it all the way back to the complete origin, um, I suppose it owes its origin to the fact that my parents read the Narnia books to me when I was a kid. Wow. Uh, except in my case, I didn't just stop there, as a lot of people do. I um, I began reading his his other fiction and then his Christian apologetics and. I came here to Oxford. Um, I'm speaking to you from Oxford, where I'm a, a fellow of one of the colleges, even though I'm also a professor of apologetics at Houston Baptist University. Um, I came here to Oxford to do an English degree and studied Lewis more formally for the first time in my life. I wrote a short undergraduate thesis on him. And as a result of that, was asked to do a bit of tutoring on him and give a one-off lecture and as a result of that a bit more teaching and a bit more speaking and then a bit of writing and then I ended up living in Lewis's Oxford home the Kilns as a kind of resident warden for three years and so when it came time for me to do my PhD uh, it was obvious that C.S. Lewis was going to be the subject because I was already fairly expert in Lewis's works and um, and so without much sort of deliberation um, no calculation hmm. I just ended up focusing on him and yeah he's become the topic of my whole scholarly career which is yeah. great I, i'm not complaining it's um <laughs> it's, he's a great person to write and think about yeah yeah well so um with that in mind what what do we how do we describe you are you uh, an apologist a literary critic uh english uh don like philosopher how, how do you describe yourself i guess uh probably a literary critic with theological interests. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm certainly not a philosopher, and we'll perhaps be coming on to that when we when we start talking about the abolition of man. Yeah. Yes, that's probably the best way to categorize me. I'm right on the borderline between English and theology. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Um, and then, while you were doing your, I uh, mean, I, I don't know if it's called what it's called over uh, in the UK. We over here PhD dissertation. Do you guys call them dissertations as well? Yep. Okay. So when you're doing your dissertation, uh, you had this. I don't know. Was it an epiphany of of you? You broke the Narnia code. You cracked it. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a kind of epiphany, really, because um, 
there was a mystery about the Narnia Chronicles, about what it was that sort of tied them together. Lots of people had probed that mystery, trying to suggest ways in which you could you could read the the seven Narnia books with a with a great greater degree of sort of coherency or uniformity to them, because a lot of people have pointed out they seem a bit slapdash or a bit yeah. haphazard. Different characters, different different literary traditions, um, different tones and atmospheres from book to book, and all sorts of different theories have been advanced, like the seven deadly sins or the right. seven sacraments or any seven that people could think of, really. Mm -hmm. Um, but nobody had seriously considered the one seven, which is all over Lewis's other works, namely the seven heavens, right. the seven planets of the medieval cosmos, which is everywhere in Lewis's writings as a medieval scholar, as a, as a novelist in his Ransom trilogy, as a poet. He's constantly talking about these, and he, he explicitly describes the seven heavens as spiritual symbols of permanent value, which are especially mm -hmm. worthwhile in our own generation. Yeah. So it's no surprise once you see it, that the Narnia book should be keyed to those seven spiritual symbols, one planet per book. And Lewis takes the characteristics, the attributes, the influences of each of these seven heavens, and he turns them into a plot and into a, an atmosphere. And most importantly, he uses them to govern the way he portrays his Christ character, Aslan. Aslan sort of sums up the, the planetary personality in his own person. It, it's so fantastic when I um, I believe I first found out about this from a video. I, I think I, I bought it on, on Amazon Prime or something. I think it's like the Narnia code, something like that. And then I, I grabbed the book, Planet Narnia. I recommend uh, all the listeners grab this book. It's fantastic. Uh, it's just there's so much extra stuff in here, too, that you'll learn. Just That's one of the cool things about lear learning Lewis is you have to learn a lot of extra stuff. And it just opens your mind to history and philosophy and uh poetry and all these different uh, experts. It's, it's fantastic. Um, so I've been seriously blessed by that. Uh, it's, it's been huge in my life. What do you, how would you describe, so you describe yourself for us. How would you describe Lewis? I remember there's this one quote, I, I forgot who it was. Maybe you'll know. Uh, they said, he, uh, Lewis is like the best example of an Italian humanist because of all of his, his genres. H how would you describe Lewis? Um, well, he's certainly a large man <laughs> of, of many and varied interests. Yeah. Um, of course, he was professionally a, an English literary critic and historian. Mm -hmm. that, that was his career, teaching here at Oxford for most of his working life and then finishing at Cambridge. Um, so if people are defined by their profession, then that's how you would define Lewis as, a, as an academic, a, an English literary academic. Um, but of course, he's not best known for that. He's best known probably for Narnia mm -hmm. and maybe the Screwtape Letters, um, but also for works of Christian apologetics. So he's got really three main strings to his bow, academia, fiction, and apologetics. And I mean, that's one of the reasons why he's so endlessly fascinating to write about, because um, there, there's so much on, on so many different topics, so many different angles. It's very hard to get tired of C.S. Lewis. Uh, and if ever you do, you know, run out of enthusiasm for one particular line of his work, then you just switch to the other for a bit and, <laughs> and freshen yourself up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's probably how I would define him as a, an academic who wrote fiction and apologetics. Yeah, that's I think that's that's apt. Um I, I think you're absolutely right with he wrote in so many different mediums. My my favorite is essay. I love his essays. I got his collected essays. I read them I, uh, for for two years. I was trying to read one every day and, and I was pretty successful. It was fantastic. So it's it's deep in here. But then when I would get sick of that, you know, I'd go to Till We Have Faces or something. Yeah. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that he regarded Paralandra, Till We Have Faces and The Abolition of Man as his three best works. Is, does that sound right? Um. He said that the that Till We Have Faces was far and away his best work, and by think by that I think he meant, meant best novel. Okay. Um, within the trilogy, the Ransom trilogy, he said Paralandra was the best. Okay. But he said that his favorite of the Ransom trilogy was that hideous strength. Right. 
because he distinguished between best and favorite. Okay, so, okay, that's interesting. Uh, it's sort of objectively better, better Perilandra, but that hideous strength he he likes more personally. Um, and he also said of that hideous of of the abolition of man, it's almost my favorite among my books. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a fairly high estimation of, of of that very little known work, which we're going to be talking about a bit. Yeah, yeah. So. You mentioned, so we're going to be talking about your book, After Humanity, which is fantastic, by the way. It's a guide to C.S. Lewis's Abolition of Man, and it came with a, a new a new covered Abolition of Man, uh, which is one of my favorites of his, and I think he's right to regard those three uh, it's so highly. Um, you mentioned in the book that he was, I don't know if sad, uh, he, he lamented that it didn't have a wider audience or that it didn't sell as well, but you, you also mentioned that it, it sold pretty well for a a work of moral philosophy. What do you make of his his uh, sadness regarding sales there? I think it's partly um, humility that he tended to downplay his own success. Mm. Um, he was also just not a very worldly man. He was never very good with figures or income or tax matters. Um, <laughs> and he, you know, I think he sort of inherited from his father a, a rather sort of pessimistic attitude to to money and worldly matters. He it was always, you know, two, we're two steps away from the workhouse. Um, <laughs> so I, I think there's a bit of that going on. Um, but also maybe just a, a slightly unrealistic comparison that he was making between the success of the abolition of man and the success of his other works. Mm, yeah. So, I mean, the screw tape letters sold gazillions of copies but of course it was going to because it's very very funny it's engaging it's popular it's it's witty um it's a classic um the abolition of man is a work of fairly dense philosophizing yeah um, it originated as three high level academic lectures at the university of durham so of course that's not going to sell as well as the screw tape letters right um, but having said that it's still sold jolly well uh, for a work of its kind and established a, a permanent reputation for itself and is now widely admired across a, a, a broad spectrum of opinion. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why I thought it was worth writing a guide to the abolition of men, because it's still pretty widely read, but not very widely understood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Well, so that, that brings us uh, just naturally right into so why why this book and why now uh, was was there is there a particular timely reason or because you, you finally had a chance to to write this? Well, the immediate um, precipitating cause was just an invitation to write a, a foreword to an, an edition of the Abolition of Man, and that grew and grew and grew and grew and mm. grew until it became this standalone guide. Um, but the reason I accepted that initial invitation was because um, yeah, the Abolition of Man as I say, it's still being read, but it's not as well understood as it ought to be. And um, it's, I think, only becoming more relevant as time goes by. Mm -hmm. um, we can talk about that, the reasons for the relevance um, later on. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm no philosopher myself, I, as I said. I, and I, when I first read The Abolition Man, found it difficult. And indeed, I still do in some respects find it difficult because I've not I'm not philosophically trained. I don't teach philosophy except when I teach the abolition of man, yeah. uh, because it's part of a C.S. Lewis. Um, and so when I have taught the abolition of man to my students, I've seen that they wrestle with it, too, and are often very nonplussed by it because it's so relatively dense by Lewis's standards. Mm -hmm. um, and so both for my own sake and for the, my, the sake of my students, I... I wanted to clarify things. I hope to bring a bit of light to to this otherwise slightly dimly lit area. Um, so those are the reasons. Yeah, those are great reasons. Uh, one of my goals in life is to uh, write something similar to this for uh, miracles. I've been thinking about miracles. It's my favorite book. I read it at least once a year. Um, my favorite book, you know, outside outside of scripture. And uh, I'm I'm pursuing. I'm looking to do a PhD in philosophy in order partly to write a, a philosophical commentary on it, because I think it's just so fantastic. So seeing you do this, it's like you've given me and, and a lot of, of others like the the guide, you know, this is what you do 
Um, so it's been super helpful for me to think about, you know, and if someone else writes one to miracles, that's cool. I'll still write one. Who cares? But uh, very, very uh, excited about this. And it's interesting to note that um, people have been noting this over and over. But for the listeners that Lewis was a, a philo- he, he is a philosopher. This is a work of moral philosophy. And he's not um, talking out of turn. You know, he's not talking out of school. Can you can you fill us in on Lewis's uh, philosophical credentials? Yeah, uh, and I suppose I should have mentioned that when I when I gave that thumbnail sketch of how to define him, because I said he was an academic in English literature, mm-hmm. and that was the bulk of his career. Right. But he, his career actually began in philosophy. The first teaching position that he had here at Oxford was a philosophical position, um, tutoring and lecturing. And indeed, his focus was on uh, moral value, which becomes the subject of the abolition of man. Um, And he himself had studied classical philosophy as an undergraduate at Oxford. Um, So he, he, and indeed, he applied for lots of jobs in philosophy and and would have contentedly at that point taken up a career in philosophy if he could have got one. Um, But everything he applied for, he failed to get. And the one English job that he applied for, he did get. Um, So, uh, yeah, Lewis is not speaking out of school. Um, he, He continued to teach students studying philosophy, uh, even after he became an English literary figure. Um, And so when he was asked to deliver um, this series of lectures at the University of Durham, actually, they're not Oxford lectures, but Durham lectures, uh, Durham being a town in the north of England, um, perhaps the third oldest of the three English universities, the three oldest English universities, Oxford, Cambridge, Durham. Um, it was it was very natural for him to speak about um, this matter of of moral value, um, which he could address with some degree of philosophical expertise. Um, and by the way, I, just to come back to your previous point about miracles, yeah, mm-hmm. miracles is a fantastic book. It's it's been much l- less studied than it should be. Right. Um, Every time I go back to Miracles, I'm struck afresh by how brilliant it is, especially the second half. Yeah. The first half is quite difficult, I always think. And indeed, the, the, the Miracles is the only book by C.S. Lewis that I did not succeed in completing at the first attempt. <laughs> I got bogged down in the first half, where it's, mm. where it's very complicatedly philosophical. Mm. Um, but the second half is a ride. It's a brilliant yeah. Roller coaster ride of, of glories and color and and his theological imagination almost in overdrive. It's fantastic. Yeah. So yeah, if your listeners, if the viewers of this podcast haven't read Miracles, they they should drop everything and go straight to it. That's great. That's a great point. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the title, and you had some interesting thoughts on that. Um, why is it called the abolition of man? The abolition of man is both a defense and a prophecy. It's a defense of moral value, the objectivity of value. Um, But it's also a prophecy about what may come to pass if we embrace subjectivism, Mm -hmm. if we deny the objectivity of value and think that we just make up moral value from our own, you know, private perspective. and Lewis's argument is that um, if, if we begin to try to suppose that we can create moral values from our own will, our own appetite, whatever it is that may be motivating us at the time, um, we'll be rapidly dehumanizing ourselves. Yeah. Um, because it, this, um, this capacity to do something that is objectively good, even when it costs us something, and that's a crucial test of the objectivity of value, our, our willingness to suffer and maybe even mm. die in defense of the good. Um, if we give up on all that, then we either descend into animality, um, we become you no know, different from the beasts, red in tooth and claw, um, you know, the, the Darwinian struggle for survival, the survival of the fittest, um, or and which is just as bad, in some ways possibly even worse, we evaporate upwards into full spirituality. uh, And it's not that we will become like the angels necessarily, 
we're more likely to become like the demons, the, the devils, the fallen angels, because uh, they are disembodied spirits. They're, they're, they have the light of reason, but they don't have bodies. And if we deny our embodiedness, um, that, that's not a good step into spirituality because the very definition of, of a human being is a, a rational animal. Uh, we are we we have both reason in our minds and uh, animality in our bodies, and mm -hmm. combining visceral man and cerebral man is is the very project that Lewis is trying to defend and and analyze uh, in the abolition of man, because it's in the chest, the liaison officer between our head and our belly, uh, that you find the definitively human faculty. Yeah. So that that's um, you were really helpful for me in, in thinking through this. And I, a lot of connections kind of came through um, Lewis's uh, platonic view of the soul um, and, and whether or not he held this. Around, it, it seems like he did. He, you, you mentioned, you know, head, belly, chest. And if you look in out of the silent planet, he's got three types of aliens, Sorns, Fifiltrigi and Prasa. And it, it seems like they they line up perfectly well, um, but they 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 all work in harmony because they're not the, a, a fallen planet. And I think that, um, I don't know if he's just, if he's just saying this would be fun to imagine if this were true, or if that's actually how he viewed us. It seems like his, I mean, the first chapter is called men without chests and it seems exactly what you said. If you don't have the chest to rule, either we become this, this disembodied head that, um, uh, you know, you get Nietzsche's strong man and he is, uh, ruling in a totalitarian fashion, or we just become these, beasts who who yeah were separated from our minds does, does that sound right do you think that he was um he had a platonist view of of the soul uh possibly um i mean he he had a lot of time for for certain aspects of plato yeah, yeah. um and he gives a nod to plato uh, once or twice in the course of the abolition of man yeah. um but to be honest i, I would i would more naturally look towards Aristotle okay. of the two great Greek masters um, as the, the sort of more pres the more presiding background intelligence um, in the abolition of man. Um, the Aristotelian view of ethics, the, the, yeah. the um, I mean, Lewis quotes how Aristotle says that the aim of education is to make, make the pupil like and dislike what he ought yeah. to like and dislike. Right. And that that moral formation is is really the key driver of of the positive side of the abolition of man. I mean, there's a good deal of negative predictions going on in the abolition of man too, and that's why he, he has this rather dystopic and alarmist title. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a work of of um, almost apocalyptic um, doom about what awaits us if we go continually down this subjectivist path. Um, but when he's on the positive strand of his argument, um, I think he's drawing possibly more on Aristotle than Plato. Okay, that's really helpful. And that reminds me, so I started, I grabbed this book um, because I heard so many Christian apologists quoting from it and saying, you know, we we uh, castrate and then we bid the, the geldings to uh, be fruitful. And I, it's chalked full of amazing quotes. Yeah. So I read it and then I didn't like you said, like, I didn't quite understand what he was getting at. And for him to say, to talk about the objective nature of beauty, I'm like, okay, morality, fine, but beauty and, and the, the goal of education is to educate them on, on, you know, what, on how to see beauty and, and objectively, like it's, it all starts with this waterfall. That's why I picked the background. That's why you picked uh, the, the cover of your book as a waterfall, because, you know, Coleridge, they're having this debate, whether it's sublime or beautiful. And, um, the authors of this green book, they're trying to inculcate a type of subjectivism into their students, and that drives Lewis nuts. Um, so I, I think it's it's really uh, appropriate that you said it's about he's following Aristotle in in education. Um, can you lay out the uh, the antagonists, uh, Lewis's foils uh, for you know in the green book? Yeah, so he talks about this green book, which, happened to be green. <laughs> now, that's why he calls it the Green Book, but it was in fact called the control of language. Um, so he, he never tells his readers the real name of this book. Um, 
neither does he ever tell us the real names of the authors of the book. Um, he masks them as Gaius and Titius, though in reality they were called Alec King and Martin Ketley. Um, because he's he's just wanting to use this textbook as a kind of springboard into his main argument about subjectivism, yeah. and he I think he he regards this textbook as a as a as a useful sort of opening salvo, partly because, um, I mean we all remember textbooks and how boring textbooks could be when we were at school, and how how uninteresting they could sometimes be, but. Um, also, I think he's he's wanting to tap into our very natural desire to protect children from um, propagandizing. Right. Uh, and that's, I think, Lewis's main objection to the Green Book. It's not so much that it's preaching subjectivism. It's that it's preaching subjectivism when it's meant to be talking about English composition. Right. Um, it's, it's, um, it's kind of criminal. It's not just in error. It's it's doing something objectively bad because um, I mean he there are there are respectable philosophers who will try and argue openly for subjectivism and, and Lewis is prepared to engage with them people like uh, I A Richards and uh, A J Ayer and others um, I mean he doesn't agree with them he thinks they're desperately and dangerously wrong but at least they're upfront about what they're arguing yeah what's so terrible about the Green Book is that it's sort of predisposing children to a subjectivist habit of thought before they even know what subjectivism is. Yeah. Yeah. So um, with that in mind, I, I think, I think this came up with Jerry, maybe he wrote about it in his dissertation, but um, Lewis talks about in, in writing, I, I believe he's exhorting, ex exhorting Christians to do likewise. And he says, our Christianity should be latent in our works. Um, we should be like, you know, the best at what we do for writing books. So in the Chronicles of Narnia, I could see someone saying, hey, look, you, uh, Lewis, you're mad at uh, Gaius and Titius because they are, their subjectivism is latent in their work. And yet here you are incul inculcating uh, your Christian view of the world um, without, perhaps without argument, though I think there's some arguments in the Chronicles of Narnia. Um, is that a, is that a, what do, what do you make of that of that argument? Does that does that fit, or is there a discontinuity because Lewis mm. is for truth, goodness, and beauty, and not subjectivism? Well, of course, uh, Lewis would say there's a very significant difference between <laughs> uh, smuggling poison into your child's dinner <laughs> and smuggling vitamins into your child's dinner. Hmm. Um, you know that, that's a, that's the obvious. Uh, sort of come back to that objection. Yeah. Uh, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's fine. Yeah. Um, but if you're, you know, if you're adding a spoonful of arsenic to the medicine, uh, that's not so good. So that that's one objection. But of course, okay. that just that just pushes the argument back to, well, what do you consider to be good? Right. Um, I think a, a, a probably a more pertinent come back to that objection is that there's a big difference between a textbook and a work of fiction. Mm. So in Narnia, you're reading an avowed work of imagination, of creativity. And of course, every work of fiction has a an ostensible storyline, you know, a superficial message, but it's coming from any number of um, philosophical, theological presuppositions. Yeah which the author will be promoting with varying degrees of deliberateness. Um, and it's naive to suppose that you can read any work of fiction or see any film or see any play without being um, affected in some degree by the author's worldview. Yeah. Um, I mean, T.S. Eliot says that all art affects us whether it means to or not, and we are affected by all art, whether we mean to be or not. And George Orwell says somewhere that... Um, all art is propaganda. Yeah, all art is yeah. propaganda. Not all propaganda is art. Right. But all art is propagating a, a message of some kind, and it would be naive to suppose otherwise. Um, but with a textbook, 
a school textbook which is supposedly about English composition, you don't expect it to be really propagating any philosophy about subjectivism or, or for that matter, even the objectivity of value. Just, just focus on the text and, and teach us how to read English. Um, I mean, that itself perhaps sounds rather naive, but um, I think that's that's probably enough to, for, for now to, 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 to defend Lewis on that score. That's a, a fantastic point. I, I really appreciate, I got to chew on that more. I really think that's, that's super, super interesting. Um, I think that's right. Yeah. And, and if they had, if Gaish and Titius, I actually, uh, King and I got to look up their names cause I'm used to them as Gaish and Titius, um, King and Ketley, if they had said, look, this is a textbook in the vein of, uh, logical positivism, would that, mm. would that change things or would it still be like, well, look, you, you shouldn't be trying to push logical positivism to, to kids. Well, I mean, if if it was an avowed book on logical positivism, um, it wouldn't be being used as a textbook. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, because <laughs> it's only up, you know after a certain age, you know, fourteen probably at the youngest, uh, that you would be introduced to anything like logical positivism in school. Um, it probably wouldn't probably wouldn't reach it until you got to university if you yeah. were if you're studying philosophy. So, um, I don't know. It, the the point is really not so much that the green book is good or bad ah. it's just a convenient foil for lewis to get into his larger argument about the objectivity of value so yeah. um i mean it's interesting that there's no reference at all to the green book or to king and ketley uh, in the third of the three chapters of the abolition of man it, it's fallen away it's not lewis's main concern yeah it's just like a jumping a, off point oh yeah i describe it as a booster rocket it, yeah. it gets the spacecraft launched and then it drops away yeah Okay. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, so I wanted to ask you about the Tao because hmm, I, I'd never really had a problem with it. At first I was like, okay, is that Taoism? Like what, what's going on there? But then I, I, I think I understood that pretty early on, but sometimes you know, in Christian circles, um, I'm in a lot of different Christian circles with a lot of different types of folks. Some of them get all worked up about this and they're like, this is syncretism. You know, C.S. Lewis is, is blending all of these, uh, all these different religions and he's, he's taking away the uniqueness of, of Christianity and it's terrible. Um, can you help us with that? Like what, what is the Tao? Why does Lewis use that word um, to describe objective morality? Uh, lots of reasons. I think it's a very canny move, um, which comes from all, from all sorts of considerations, I think. And one is that by choosing this Chinese word, um, he immediately universalizes his point which is which is indeed part of his aim to show that moral value is universal it's part of our humanity to be able to discern value and see it as objective you don't need to be a christian you don't need to be a theist to discern objective value and that's why at the end of the abolition of man he has this appendix listing eight different moral laws or duties uh, and each moral law is supported by a quotation, by, by many quotations, from any number of different traditions and cultures around the world. Uh, Native American, Aboriginal Australian, uh, a ancient Babylonian, Egyptian, Jewish, Christian, Hindu, um, Norse. And by citing all these different authorities in support of the moral law in question, Lewis is trying to bolster his main contention that all people, if they are operating humanly, can discern certain moral values. Not all moral values necessarily, and of course there are differences and differences of emphasis um, between cultures, but there is a surprising degree of unanimity about yeah. our, du our duty to our ancestors and elders, our duty to children and posterity, uh, our duty of general beneficence to all people, our duty of special beneficence to those who are close to us, our duty of uh, veracity and good faith, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. uh, you you cannot find a culture in which cowardice is applauded and that in which soldiers are commended for throwing down their arms and surrendering. Um, that just goes against the grain of our human nature. Yeah. And it's it's that anthropological argument that Lewis is trying to make. 
Um, so it's not syncretism at all. It's it's basic uh, natural theology, which is a very biblical concept, yeah. because after all, all human beings have been made in the image of God. Yeah. And it's part of the image of God that we have a, a conscience. God has implanted in us some sort of awareness of right and wrong, good and evil. And that's why St. Paul can say in his letter to the Romans that um, even the Gentiles who are without the law are a law unto themselves. Mm -hmm. And their conscience now acquits them, now condemns them. Uh, and certain things about God, his invisible power and so on and so forth, are, are discernible from the things that he has made. Yeah. So there's a certain common grace, a certain general revelation of God to all people, um, which Christians should not be afraid of. That's not syncretism at all. Syncretism is when you say there's no difference between Christianity and these other religions. But Lewis is not saying that. He's just saying there is a certain level of overlap, but there is nonetheless a distinctive, a vitally distinctive aspect to, to, to well, first of all, theism and then to Christianity. Mm -hmm. But as he says very clearly in The Abolition of Man, though I am myself a theist and indeed a Christian, I'm not attempting here any even indirect argument for theism. He's setting his sights very low. Hmm. He's not doing what he does in mere Christianity, right. um, where he starts with a very similar moral argument and then advances from that to, well, we've got this natural law, so that suggests a, a lawgiver. And if we've got a lawgiver, a divine lawgiver, then we need a divine law keeper and law transcender, namely Jesus Christ. Um, that's how he plays it all out in mere Christianity. Mm -hmm. But in the abolition of man, all he's trying to do is the first step. Let's sit down and agree what it is that makes us human. And, and the answer that Lewis comes to is this ability to discern value and recognize it as objective. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. And I, I think you're absolutely right, um, especially regarding Romans 1 and 2. And yeah, if 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 humans didn't know right and wrong, it, it might be kind of hard to see how God could hold them accountable for, for doing right and wrong. And you, um, I, I believe I'm just grabbing this quote from your book, but you say the Tao is not something people make up, but it's something we discover. And that's really the, the heart behind Lewis. Like it's it's out there. It's, uh, it is objective. And then like you said, yeah, he grabs, he's, he's arguing in the abolition of man for the objective nature. And then he grabs that and says, now here's what it implies. Here's what it entails. Here's why you should believe in God. If you believe this, mm. um, people, uh, like, um, BF Skinner, he, he takes Lewis's, uh, he flips it. He flips abolition of man on its head and, and says, yeah, he's, he's right. Like, uh, he takes Lewis's warning and just goes down with it and says, that's exactly right. And we should condition humans to act a certain way um can you can you are you familiar at all with with skinner's work on and his uh connection to lewis and how he, he thinks about that not really no um i i ref refer to bf skinner a, a couple of times in in the book uh, lewis himself if i'm remembering rightly never refers to skinner in the abolition of man mm -hmm. um well maybe maybe he couldn't even have known of him i can't remember the dates of skinner but yeah. um Anyway, um, yeah, B.F. Skinner said this abolition of man that Lewis is predicting um, is long overdue and is much to be welcomed. <laughs> right, right, which uh, is so so insane to think about that someone would 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 want that. Um, when I, I don't want to go too much, I don't want to like um, you know make you crawl up on a cross or anything right now. But when it comes to today's education. Have we gotten better, worse, or stayed the same since the time of of Lewis um, attacking, you know, this type of indoctrination of our of our kids? Uh, well, I suppose it depends where you look. Sure, because, you know, education is a very large thing. Yeah, um, and there are as many types of education really as there are educators. That's a good uh, point, and possibly. Even that's not quite accurate. There are many types of education as there are classes led by educators mm. because, you know, the same teacher can can now be a good teacher and now a bad teacher, depending on, you know, on the day and the topic. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I, I... How about how about as a, as a culture? Um, 
have we embraced subjectivism more uh, or less? Uh, uh, Western culture, whatever, you, uh, you can speak for, for the culture that you're most familiar with. Um, have people taken his advice? Have, have I, It hasn't got the wide audience that, that uh, the Chronicles of Narnia have, but he, he's been talking about this a lot, the poison of subjectivism. He puts it in a lot of his books as well. Has our culture uh, embraced subjectivism more or have they gone away from it more uh, since Lewis's time or, or maybe stayed the same? I think uh, embraced it more and more. Okay. Um, and one of the little pieces of evidence I accumulate uh, in After Humanity is, is simply a linguistic point that the word post-truth is now a term. Indeed, it was the Oxford Dictionary's word of the year in 2016. Right. Um, so we, we now live in a post-truth world, we're told, um, in which... Um, you make up your own reality. Uh, if if you want it to be true, it is true. And who else can tell you otherwise? Uh, you you do your truth, and I'll do my truth. And yeah. and that's supposed to liberate us somehow. Um, but of course, it just ends up uh, installing us in our own individualistic silos, unable really to make any meaningful contact with with another perspective. Um, so it's a disastrous. Uh, overemphasis upon one aspect of what is the truth, namely that we are, we do have personal preferences and we are subjects. And Lewis isn't denying that we have subjectivity. Mm -hmm. All he's arguing is that even though we are subjects, even though we are individuals, there is nonetheless objective value which we can perceive and which we can grow in knowledge of. Mm -hmm. um, it's an objective thing out there. We perceive it subjectively, but that's very different from saying it is therefore subjective. Yeah. Now that doesn't follow at all. One of the reasons why we need one another is is to balance and correct and relieve our own subjectivity, mm -hmm. because between us we can get closer and closer to objective reality. Only oh, God sees anything as it really is, as Lewis says in, in one of his other works. Um, no human being ever has an absolutely correct understanding of everything that's out there. Uh, and, and so uh, an appropriate humility is in order. But by growth in wisdom, hopefully we attain ever more closely to the divine perspective on matters. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. And I'm reminded um, that in this work and Poison of Subjectivism and, and his moral philosophy, he is he's arguing for uh, for us to get beyond ourselves. Look, look out towards the objective world. There's an objective nature to it. But he, mm -hmm. he also has an important corrective against uh, the objective third person perspective in, in books like Miracles or De Futilitate, where he's saying you can't just assume uh, a third person perspective and or, or a meditation and tool shed and just look at the the neurons firing there's more to who you are than the physical objective what, what can be described through a third person perspective so he has a corrective on both sides that it's not look let's not be subjectivists but let's not be um let's not be this this third person uh naturalistic uh reductionist uh and so i really it's really helpful that he's got these two boundaries that we can stay in between do you think that um, Lewis's prophecy could ever come true? Could 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 humanity ever be truly become uh, men and, and women human humans without without chests? Uh, yes, I think they can, and I think, alas, some do. Hmm. Um, I think the the large scale collapse into utter subjectivism is is unlikely simply because it's a very unhappy life that you end up living okay um, and most people <laughs> their desire for happiness um, is a corrective of some sort against absolute subjectivism um, and indeed one of Lewis's points is that really what what is often advanced as a as a kind of subjectivism is really 
just the old natural law, but distorted. Right. In right. Certain ways. You know, you, you fixate upon one particular objective value. Yeah. And you you blow that, you swell that up to madness in isolation from all the rest. And this now becomes the the, the one thing necessary, the, the, the sum of all goodness. Right. And and everything else becomes subjective. But this, oh no. Yeah. I mean, you, you must not smoke. Under any circumstances, smoking is the worst possible thing a human being can do. Mm. And so, you know, that I mean, that's a silly example, of course, but um, it, it's very unlikely that you give up on all claims of objective value because it's very difficult to live a life consistently in that fashion. That's a, that's a great point. And that's, I think he, he makes that point in... in um uh mere christianity where you're living in a world with other humans and you bump into someone and now instantly it's who should apologize or mm -hmm. i gave you a piece of my orange but what the heck and now you're going right back to it and it's it's there i love that point about grabbing uh different parts of the law and that's that's usually a counter um counter to objective morality and people will say well look at this culture and in this culture they do this and it's just the exact same thing well in that culture it's very easy to see that part of the moral law and because uh, they ignore this part. It's very easy to grow up in that culture and do this or that. Like really mm. easy in the United States to grow up and be disobedient to your parents. Uh, but in the Middle East, like that's a huge deal uh, in mm. different parts of the world. But, you know, we have because we fixate on certain parts because we are fallen because Romans one and two are true. that We suppress the truth. So mm. that's just a, a fantastic point. I'm, I really appreciate that. Um, I wanted to think a little bit about. Well, before we get there, uh, I want to talk about beauty. Uh, I want to finish up with that because that one's still tough for me. Um, but the uh, that hideous strength, Lewis says, you know, I, I've written about this uh, in the abolition of man. How much? How much uh, is that true? Is is that hideous strength uh, a novelization of the abolition of man, or is it? How do you think about the the connection between the two? Yeah, that hideous strength. Um as Lewis describes it, is a tall story about devilry, though it has behind it a serious point that I have tried to make in my Abolition of Man. Mm -hmm. um, so behind all the adventures um, and the drama of that hideous strength lies this serious philosophical argument of the Abolition of Man about subjectivism. And, and you see, the villains of that hideous strength are deliberately trying to kill objective value. Um, and there are many other points of connection between the abolition of man and um, the novel. And I have a, a short passage about that in After Humanity. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to resist going down that path too much because right. the book was meant to be a guide to the abolition of man, not to that hideous strength. Yeah. Um, and indeed, there has been recently just published a, a very good guide to the Ransom Trilogy by uh, Christiana Hale. Okay. Called, uh, it's called deep heaven i think um so i if you want to know more about that hideous strength i suggest you go to christiana hale yeah. um but yeah um it's certainly important that we uh, are aware of that hideous strength and indeed if people find the abolition of man difficult um one way of getting into the abolition of man is to read or reread that hideous strength because yeah. you may find it easier to understand his basic point when you see it dramatized uh, in the novel yeah, the, the, yeah. Two, the two books are very, you know, very good to read together. Yeah, it, the the funny thing about Lewis is is you just start pulling that thread and it keeps going. And you look at essays like The Inner Circle or Poison of Subjectivism, and you, oh, here here it is again. It's another line. I don't know if it was Barfield or someone said, you know, if you pull a line on him, he's got these through lines that go through all of his work, uh, which is just fantastic. I th I believe that that hideous strength was written maybe a year before uh, 1984, and it. It's like one of the great dystopian novels of the last century that I don't think a lot of people know about. I don't. Do you, are you any any idea about the reception of that book? Of that hideous strength. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting actually that w one person who reviewed it was none other than George Orwell, right? The author of 1984. Yeah. Um, and George Orwell didn't much like that hideous strength. Um, he gave it a very poor review in the Manchester Evening News, I think it was, um, in which he said that the problem with 
that hideous strength was that the supernatural kept breaking in. <laughs> and it would have been better if Mr. Lewis had kept his story all on one level. Yeah. And, um, and that's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's Orwell's perspective. Um, but and, I don't think but, he, but, Lewis couldn't have written that hideous strength um, no. on a purely humanistic um, level. Right. And that's, that's like, yeah, Orwell is like Lewis without hope. You know, he's like, like the, the way he's writing and stuff. And actually Lewis, uh, as I'm sure, you know, wrote uh, a review of 1984 and animal farm. And I mm. thought that was like spot on. I love Lewis. It's hard for me to disagree with him, but here I'm, I mean, he's just totally right. He talks about how, when you make it, when you put an animal face on it, uh, it makes the character, it, it makes them pop. It makes them stick out more. And it's like, well, yeah, that's what you did in Narnia. So that makes sense why you would do that. And you just get a deeper insight then he's got this thing about Orwell, uh, Orwell's weirdness about sex in that book, um, mm. because of maybe his his Puritan upbringing. Not Puritan, because Lewis wouldn't say that, but his uh, uh, his weirdness with sex. He's got this weird thing in in uh, 1984. So yeah, Lewis as a critic as well is just so fascinating to help me understand these great works. It's it's fantastic. So. You being a critic of Lewis is super helpful for me to understand Lewis and help me understand uh, Orwell, which is fantastic. Uh, so, Michael, I wanted to finish up with beauty because, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Abolition of Man is not just about objective morality, but objective value. Does, does that does that sound right? Yes. And because the Green Book is talking about um, whether or not something is sublime, uh, commenting on uh, Coleridge, Sublime isn't even in our vocabulary anymore. Uh, sublime is a band that, for anyone my age, it's a, it's just a band. Uh, are certain things like? Would you? Do you personally think are are certain things um, ought ought certain things be regarded as sublime or beautiful, and others objectively ugly? Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, and indeed, it's interesting that if if. I mean, scientific studies have been done on this. Uh, I, I remember watching a documentary a few years ago by, uh, presented by John Cleese, um, in which he, he, he put 30 faces of a person, uh, photographs of a face on a, on, a sh on a sheet, and asked people to rank them in order of beauty. Uh, and there was an incredible degree of um, unanimity about who had the most beautiful face and who had the ugliest face. Of course, no, there was a little bit of variation from person to person about about this, you know, between number three and number six, or but not between number one and number thirty. Sure. Um, yeah. And you know, this I think again speaks to Lewis's point that there's there is objective value in the world, not just good and evil, not just right and wrong, the you know the the purely moral or ethical value, but um beauty and ugliness yeah. and within beauty there are there's a range of what we consider to be beautiful from you know the sublime at the height um down to you know, the merely pretty or pleasing or charming or cute you know there are any number of gradations within the category of beauty and we can argue about those too yeah. um but one of the points of arguing about what term is correct is the recognition that there's something out there worth arguing about. Yeah. That, that, that the waterfall in, in this example has an objective value and we're looking for the right term to describe yeah. that value. And yeah, we can thrash about and we can come to slightly different viewpoints about it, but, but we must not collapse into ourselves and say, well, there is no objective value to that waterfall at all. Therefore, it matters not a jot what I call it. Right. You say potato, I say potato. Let's call the whole thing off. You know. <laughs> right. I mean that that just completely annihilates human discourse and human inquiry. Because if there is nothing objective value, then what, I mean, it, it's not just a question of the destruction of art; it's the destruction of science too. Mm -hmm. Um. Because the scientist assumes that there's some objective value that, that he's inquiring into, just as much as the painter trying to capture the beauty of this waterfall is, 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 is doing similarly from within his own framework of reference. Um, so again, it, it's, it's not, we don't have to be absolutist about this and say it's either 
objective or or subjectivist there is subjective there is subjectivity yeah. um and i want your perspective to correct mine and i i want to read what the great literary critics have said about shakespeare as opposed to you know the the local new, n newspaper editor uh, they're not on the same level yeah. in terms of literary value and and there is such a thing as uh, training your palate, um, learning to discern subtle shades of difference. Yeah. Um, and this, again, is part of what it means to be to be formed maturely in the appreciation of value, not just moral formation, but aesthetic formation, too. That's a fantastic point. It goes back to the the uh, Aristotelian influence on Lewis and, and training people to see uh, beauty and, and objective uh, values. I think. Uh, for for beauty, uh, we always say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and it seems super subjective. But uh, and and you say, well, look, someone thinks the Grand Canyon's sublime, and another person thinks it's it's gross. They don't like the dry, deserty, arid uh, temperature, all that stuff. But just because there's disagreement doesn't mean there's not something there. You can t uh, several uh, you can have a whole class of students disagreeing on the the answer to a mathematical equation doesn't mean there's not a, a right answer to it. Um, mm. And so just, yeah, just because there's, there's disagreement on on v objective value or value out there doesn't mean it's not actually out there and, and able to be discovered. I think one of the best things, one of the most formative things Lewis has ever said, which is super random, but he said, I believe he said this. I hope I'm not misquoting. He was talking about uh, children and how he doesn't enjoy their company. He said, I, I don't enjoy the company of children. And I find that to be a fault in me. I, I ought to enjoy them, but I don't. And that has been so helpful for me because I don't have to say, look, I'm born this way. And so that must be right. I have to defend this. No, look, there's things that are wrong with me and I'm not fully living up to, I, I fall short of the glory of God. And there's certain things that maybe I should find beautiful or I should find pleasing, or I should enjoy the company of this or that type of person, but I don't. Doesn't mean I have to stay this way. Lord willing, I'll, I'll continue to grow into that image. But um, it's okay to acknowledge that I'm flawed in this way. And, mm. I, and that was the the mo single most formative thing, Lewis, for me. I know it's really random, but it's really helpful. It is. And I mean, yeah, so sometimes it's a flaw in, in oneself that one is trying to correct. And other times it's just immaturity. Sure. You know, we don't come out of our mother's wombs fully formed adults. We That's need great. to learn things. Right. We need to grow and mature and strengthen. And that is in indeed a large part of lewis's argument in the abolition of man that we we need to be properly morally formed because although objective value is objective although it is in one sense self-evident you can't appeal to anything beyond it that isn't to say that that it is obvious that's why we need moral formation we you know here, here's my my little personal anecdote is um I hated coffee when I was a little boy, mm. um, but I could see that my older brothers and my parents liked coffee. And so I thought, well, it can't be that bad. It's just something in me. Um, I need to learn to like coffee. And so my mum, God bless her, would give me very milky coffee with lots of sugar in it. It was the bitterness I couldn't cope with as a young boy. And gradually, the, the levels of milk and the levels of sugar would be reduced until I was drinking, you know, pretty much standard coffee. And I now like it. But I had to grow into that taste. Um, and I, I could have said, well, my perspective is the right perspective because I'm me. And who are you to tell me otherwise? But fortunately, I was humble, humble enough uh, to realize, well, I don't know everything. And I don't have fully, perfectly formed taste in every respect. And I need other people to help me learn these things. And I, fortunately, God, God bless them, I was blessed with very attentive, patient parents. And so, you know, I matured. Yeah. But but we've we've somehow got to the state state of thinking in certain quarters that any kind of um, questioning of another person's taste is immediately an attack upon them, okay. um, as if it were purely a moral flaw. And sometimes it is a moral flaw, but often it's just a question of immaturity. Right. That's such a great point. 
Well, Michael, thanks so much for, for all your time here. Thanks for this book. Um, it's it's opened up uh, Abolition of Man in a, in a new way for me, and I, I seriously appreciate that. Every time I get back into my, my Lewis state of mind, I think how important it is to to educate, to inculcate, to encourage, to open people's uh, imaginations. And so I am uh, I seriously appreciate you continuing on in this legacy and, and helping us think. You're, you're a thinker in your own right as well, but uh, you, you definitely open up Lewis for a lot of us. So I seriously appreciate that. Again, uh, folks at home, Planet Narnia, The Seven Heavens and the Man Imagination of C.S. Lewis and After Humanity, A Guide to C.S. Lewis's Abolition of Man. Uh, Michael, th thanks so much for all your time. My pleasure. Thank you. And before I go, let me just want, say one thing. If, if people want to get after humanity, I, I would encourage them to, to buy it through the publisher's website, because okay. that way you are sure of getting the, the free edition, the tie-in yeah. edition of The Abolition of Man. Right. If you go through Amazon, I, I'm not so certain that you will get that, but okay. you get it just part of the deal if you go through the publisher. So wordonfire.org slash humanity is the website to go to. Awesome. All right. I'll put that uh, link in the description. You guys can just find that and click on it. Um, awesome. Well, that's going to have to do it for now, folks. Uh, this has been Parker's Pensies. Uh, Lord willing, we'll, we'll be able to continue this conversation on Lewis and, and all of Dr. Ward's work. But for now, that's going to do it. This has been Parker's Pensies. And as always, all glory to God.